Thank you very much, uh, Alia, and uh, a hearty welcome to everybody who's participating in this uh, webinar. We're very happy today to uh, welcome Mr. Chris Berwoods, uh, the second speaker who was supposed to come, unfortunately was taken ill and will not be here. So I'll take a few minutes and uh, introduce uh, uh, Chris Berwoods, and um, then at the end, uh, you will have time to uh, ask questions. Um, and I will start that off uh, if uh, your questions are not ready. So uh, Chris Behoots hails from Belgium. Uh, he is an alumnus of uh, the University of Ghent, where he earned a master's degree in African history and African languages with great distinction. Since then, he has been, so to speak, in the field. His field of predilection in Africa is the former Belgian colony and protectorates, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. His research in these countries is fueled by his extensive international network of professional and personal relationships. N uh, not only in those countries, uh, but also uh, among influential actors in Europe and North America, as well as uh, in Africa. He has worked as a consultant uh, for many non-governmental organizations, uh, as uh, an organizer. Um, so he uh, has worked for Amnesty International, for instance, and also for governmental organizations such as uh, USAID, and uh, MONUSCO, which is the UN mission uh, to Congo that has now been there for many years. For five years, he was director of uh, EURAC, a network of 50 European NGOs for the purpose of advocacy for Central Africa. In the process of writing on local, national, and uh, transborder conflict, politics, human rights, security issues in Central Africa, Chris has acquired the capacity to conduct granular research as evidenced by his many articles, book chapters, mission reports, and most recently in his book entitled Congo's Violent Peace, Conflict and Struggle Since the Great African War. So there it is, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, this book has been um, endorsed by many specialists in, uh, on the Congo, including the um, uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel winner uh, for peace, uh, Dr. Denis Mukwege, uh, otherwise known as uh, the man who repairs women, uh, by Severino Tesser. Uh, but for us uh, here in Madison, most interestingly by the late uh, Crawford Young, the erstwhile uh, pioneer and uh, probably still one of the best um, scholars of uh, the Congo. Crawford Young said that uh, this, this volume is without doubt an author or authoritative work and uh, many other things of that sort. So uh, I will not take any more time. Uh, again, uh, please help me welcome uh, Chris Berwoods. You have the floor, Chris. Thank you very much, Professor Songolo. It's a great honor to be hosted in the University of, uh, by the University of Wisconsin in uh, one of the African Africa at Noon sessions. As you mentioned, I, I um, studied African languages and history in the 80s already. I started, and that's where I started to discover the works of uh, Jan van Sina and Crawford Young. So, um, their work um, had uh, an important impact on the way uh, I looked at um, Africa, African history, African-European um, uh, relationships. And that's for me, um, it's, 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 it's really um, a, great, a great joy to um, be hosted by Wisconsin. It's for me, a legendary university, it's a monument. So, uh, and on top of that, in a session facilitated by my elder brother, Aliko Songolo, 
this is for me a great experience. Thank you for that. I would like to take you in five, uh, five steps uh, in the recent, the very recent history of Congo. Um, first, you will have a, a short look at the podium where two men are sweating, at least one of them. After that, we will go back and look at the two electoral years without elections. Eh? The Congolese um, elections had great delay. We'll have a look at that. The third step is we talk about the election itself and, and the unlikely um, outcome. The fourth step is um, the endorsement. How did it get endorsed? Eh? The fifth, steps, the fifth step is, um, what are we talking about now? There's a new president, but are we talking about um, a strong presidency or should we say presidency on a leash? And then we will conclude or try to conclude, uh, we are going towards new elections. What can we expect? So to start with, I take you back to that podium. It's 20 months ago. And it's on the 24th of January, 2019. Looking at the ceremony focused around, around two men. The smaller one seems to enjoy himself. He's even smiling. It's not something he often does in public. Um, he looks relaxed and it's almost like if a burden has been taken off his shoulder, which is probably the case. Joseph Kabila, because that's his name, is the president of Congo since January 2001, after the assassination of his father, Laurent Désiré Kabila, and he's about to hand over power to the tall, heavy man beside him, Felix Chisikedi. Chisikedi is visibly very nervous and has difficulties to breathe. Apparently, they hadn't found a um, bulletproof vest in his size. He's about to faint. His collaborators help him. Give him, give him a bit of water. He apologized for the moment of weakness and starts to talk to the national and international guests of this ceremony. On that 24th uh, January 2019, Chisikedi was inaugurated as the fifth president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. For the first time in the country's history, a president left office to be replaced by an elected successor hadn't happened before. And the Felix Chisikedi is the son of the legendary opposition leader Etienne Chisikedi, who stood up against Mobutu at the end of the 70s and continued to uh, his struggle against the Kabila regime. After Etienne died in 2017, Felix Chisikedi has become the president of the historical opposition party, UDPS, Union pour la démocratie et le progrès social. But this historical moment, uh, it definitely is historical, but it's not the result of a transparent democratic process. It's quite the contrary. Chisikidi has been declared the winner of an unlikely electoral coup based on manipulated results and an unexpected um, alliance. In reality, he has obtained less than a third of the votes of his main competitor, Martin Fayulo. In addition, suspected electoral fraud at the parliament, parliamentary elections have returned the parliament and provincial assemblies in which Kabila's FCC, Front Commun pour le Congo, Common Front for Congo, holds a majority. So this uh, allowed Kabila to keep Chisikedi on the leash and leaves him and, and leaves the FCC with real power in most domains of public life. But Joseph Kabila had been inaugurated himself eh, um, as the first president of the Third Republic in historical election of 2006, almost six years after he succeeded his father, three years after, three years and a half after he became president of a complex transition movement, uh, transition period. His victory in 2006 was extremely important. It was a step towards the restoration of legitimacy. Um, in Congo, which had disappeared in the first weeks and months uh, of independence after the neutralization first 
in September 60 and the assassination, the physical assassination of the uh, elected prime minister at that moment, Patrice Lumumba. Um, in 2011, Kabila was elected for a second, uh, second term and constitutionally that was his last mandate. That was supposed to be his last mandate. And in the running up to the election scheduled for 2016, people started to speculate if really he would invest in the process to hand over power. Several maneuvers and ambiguous signals created the impression that he was interested, really interested to change the constitution in order to create an environment which allowed him to stand for a third term. But he tried and he was not able to do that. Eventually, he deployed a series of strategies to delay the elections in an attempt to remain in power simply by not organizing the elections to install a successor. Congolese jokingly called it le glissement, yeah, the sliding of time. On 20 December 2016, his second mandate expired and Congo entered a phase of two years in a constitutionally very uncertain environment with serious risks uh, to the security situation, a serious risk that the country would implode, collapse. There are a few characteristics to that period, and one of them is the rise of the street. Huh? All of a sudden, um, we had the impression that the population was an unpredictable, unpredictable actor who could make the difference. Huh? Um, and that started in January 2015, when riots broke out in various cities uh, over proposed changes to the electoral law and demonstrated the important role that urban population could, uh, could play in the upcoming elections. What we see was um, masses of frustrated people, frustrated because of their precarious socioeconomic living conditions, frustrated because they perceived the regime as increasingly um, unrepresentative and unresponsive to their needs, people started to organize and come together in a spontaneous way. There, it was difficult to see the logics of it. Eh? The, the, the um, demonstrations did not follow the orders coming from the opposition, coming from civil society. It had something sp um, spontaneous and especially um, a, a potentially very violent. The um, regime developed an obsession uh, uh, about it. It, uh, it was impossible to predict where, when, and even if such violence would erupt, but it was possible and it could start an uncontro uncontrollable wave of violence, which could spread to the, to the country and swipe away the regime and leave the Congo behind in institutional ashes on which it's very, very hard to rebuild the state. The regime invested in a professional repression machinery that turned out to be very effective, but only in a few places. It was impossible to organize it elsewhere. The focus was on Kinshasa and uh, Lubumbashi. A second characteristic of that period was um, the manipulation of local conflict uh, by provincial and national um, politicians with, with ambitions and who wanted to have themselves on, on the map and show power, that manipulation started to increase. It always existed, but in, uh, in the period 2016, 17, 18, it uh, totally ran out of hand. Uh, the most known um, cases were Bini, where the conflict existed for a long time, but it intensified, and the Kasai, where, uh, which had remained all those years relatively calm, and all of a sudden, um, we witnessed how a very local issue on customary power was uh, <coughs> rising and in a few weeks or months time, affected the security in uh, four or five uh, provinces. A third thing which is very important in that period that 
we saw a shift eh, in the a change in the landscape of African politics around Congo. Since the M23 crisis in 2012-2013, African multilateral institutions had successfully claimed ownership over the Congolese conflict as an African issue. Eh? The result of the diplomatic competition between, on the one hand, eh? on the one hand between African and Western instances, and on the other hand, within the uh, tensions within and between the African institutions like SADC, IC, GLR, uh, Africa, East African Community, and the African Union. Um, we've seen that uh, a short but very intensive um, diplomatic struggle in those days, yeah? uh, just after the fall of Goma. And the result was the deployment of an entirely steered, uh, SADC steered new MONISCO peacekeeping brigade which effect effectively contributed to the neutralization of M23. And this is a very decisive turning point, which uh, has its impact until today. It changed the picking order of the different players in the international Congo debate. Africa had assertively, successfully taken the lead, had um, claimed the, the ownership over this African conflict and had obtained it. In the last years of Kabila's second term and the two years of Glissement, eh, sliding of time, it became very clear that the African multilateral organizations considered um, stability in Congo as one of their top priorities. They knew how dramatic the implosion of Congo, Congo could be and would be on their own uh, development, security, etc. Um, one of the, the most important partners changing uh, it, uh, its attitude was Angola. Hmm? Angola, who had literally saved the Kabila regime since uh, the days of Father Kabila, yeah? but several times, again, under Joseph Kabila, had saved the regime uh, to an extent that Joseph Kabila started to consider the loyalty of, of Angola, of President Dos Santos in those days, as something he could take for granted, something which was personalized. I don't think it ever was. Uh, the Angolans considered for a long time Kabila as the best bet, the best bet for uh, relative stability in Congo. And the loyalty, the, the support stopped on the moment that they did no, did no longer have that idea, that they thought they saw Kabila more as part of the problem than part of the solution from their perspective. It was very important development. 2017, Kabila lost two more allies when uh, Emerson Nangangwa replaced Mugabe in Zimbabwe and in South Africa, Joseph Zuma did, uh, Jacob Zuma did his best to uh, organize his own succession, but failed to do that and eventually was replaced by Ramaphosa. At the end of 2017, it looked like Kabila had lost his major allies on the continent, probably apart from Presidents Gurunziza of Burundi and Magufuli of Tanzania. So it was clear that the African multilateral institutions would play an important role in accompanying Congo in its political transition. That's the most important uh, pressure from above, international pressure. The pressure from below was coordinated by the Congolese, and eh? within the Congolese public opinion was coordinated by the bishops, by the National Conference of the Catholic Bishops, SENCO. Um, they organized civil society, the population, is, uh, Senko is very well organized in every corner of the country. Their commitment to uh, stop the Kabila's attempt to, to organize a, a, a third mandate um, had so much street credibility that it dim diminished the, the, the potential of violence. So, in August 2018, it was clear that there would be elections. Eh? 
the coordinated uh, pressure from the region and from the grassroots organized by, by um, the bishops made it clear that Kabila needed to go. So he organized a congress within his own, well, not, not, a, not a formal congress, but a meeting within his own camp to um, indicate a successor. A very intensive moment. Um, there were um, important lobbies, um, people around former prime minister Matata Ponyo, for instance, was very present uh, and very hard working, very well organized as well. There, were, there was a specific lobby uh, um, coming from Katanga, eh? the, the, the former pro uh, province of Katanga, which is now divided in several. It remains a, for, uh, a strong lobby. Eventually, Ramazani Shaddari from Manima was uh, put forward as the FCC compromise candidate. FCC eh, is the new, was the new label of the family, political family loyal to Kabila. Front commun pour le Congo. In November 2018, which is hardly six weeks before the election, uh, the most important political families within the opposition met at Geneva. They uh, organized themselves in a new platform, La Muka, which means awake in Lingala, encouraged and, and facilitated by international players and diplomacies. They agreed on a single presidential candidate, Martin Fayulu, not a very known figure in Kinshasa, not uh, with a really national aura, but a but, uh, uh, um, politician with a lot of street credibility. Um, in, the, in the hours, uh, 24 hours after Fayulu had been uh, designated as a candidate, two main oppositions, uh, opposition leaders left Lamuka, Felix Chisikedi and um, Vital Kamere, they organized their own platform, Cash Le Cap pour le Changement, which means that we went to the electoral campaign um, with uh, three main candidates, Shadavi, Fayou and Felix Chisikedi. The expectations of uh, expectation of many observers in Congo as well as abroad was that the Kabila camp would try to um, declare Shadari elected eh? independently of the number of votes he would get. Uh, and, and many people believed that the computers, the, the voting machines, which had been extremely uh, controversial, that they would serve as the main instrument to to that, to, uh, to fabricate, if you want, the results to declare, um, to declare Shadari as the uh, successor. Campaign in the first time was, in the first weeks, was relatively calm, calmer than I had expected. Uh, we saw candidates traveling around and uh, addressing potential electorates and voters in the um, in different provinces and somewhere half December things start to get grimmer uh, when uh, a fire broke out in a warehouse of the electoral commission destroying a lot of vehicles and uh, quite a bit of the uh, famous voting machines and in the field itself you saw in different places um, rallies getting more, uh, meeting more repression and, and getting more violent. In Yumbi, on the border with Congo Brazzaville, there was an ethnic political clash uh, with many people uh, dying and really thousands of people uh, fleeing the area. Eventually, CNE, yeah, the Electoral Commission, decided to um, postpone the election for another week. Yeah? Instead of holding it on 23 of December, elections were held on the, on the 30th and uh, canceled uh, in, in districts as Bini, Butembo, and, the, uh, and in Yumbi, where I just, I just mentioned. So on Sunday, 30 December 2018, 
two years after the constitutional end of Kabila's term, the Congolese people went to vote amidst irregularities, confusion, and intimidation. Already on the same evening, eh, and that thanks to the voting machines, um, the authorities received the first signs, first results, and were horrified to see that Shatari's scores were too far behind the other two main candidates to proclaim him, pro proclaim him winner of the election, and that Fayulu would most probably obtain an absolute majority. The regime approached Chisikedi and eh, Chisikedi camp and offered their candidate the presidency to avoid that power, to avoid that power would fall in the hands of Fayulu, especially because behind Fayulu were the major politicians like uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba, like um, um, Katumbi, who could not present themselves as a candidate. So they had supported Fayulu's um, uh, candidacy and, and were the people behind them would, would, uh, would be in power under a presidency of Fayulu. The regime wanted to, uh, Kabila's political family wanted to uh, avoid that. And so they worked out a deal where uh, Chisikedi won the elections. So um, in, at the same time, uh, people had voted for the um, national parliament for the provincial as assemblies. And there, uh, the results have never been published, but only a list has been read out on radio of the people elected. Uh, and um, the majority of Kabila's party was, was overwhelming, which would be a bit strange that, that why, why his candidates would have um, an, an overwhelming majority while his candidate for the presidency uh, scored very low figures. On January 10th, 2019, the uh, Electoral Commission proclaimed the results. Chisikedi had won, eh, was declared winner with 38.6% uh, uh, of the vote, less than 700,000 ahead of Martin Fayulu, 34.8, eh, and Ramazani Shadari, a third with 23.8. Almost immediately after that, the leaked data from uh, the Electoral Commission, uh, Commission's voting computers and data collected by Senko's uh, 40,000 um, observers gave an entirely different picture. Fayulu won with 60% uh, of the vote, Chisikedi and Shadari each around 19. Fayulu immediately challenged the results, but the Constitutional Court uh, confirmed them. Um, how do you go forward with that? It's, an, it's a masquerade, it's, it's, it's an acrobacy. How do you endorse that? It's, it has been a very interesting time, interesting days. And in the days, uh, in the days and hours, um, in the hours and days um, before Chisikedi's inauguration, there was an intensive diplom diplomatic activity which took place between and within African multilateral institutions, with SADC and African Union as key arenas. Hmm? An intensive intra African diplomacy was deployed with sometimes contradictory signals, culminating in two statements, both launched on, uh, from Addis Ababa on 17th of January with opposite messages. Um, first, Sadek congratulated and encouraged the Congolese government and the Electoral Commission for holding generally peaceful elections and called upon the international community to respect Congo's sovereignty and to support the government. Only hours after that, another meeting was held at the initiative of uh, African Union chairman at that moment, uh, Paul Kagame, with different African countries and institutions on a meeting which was not an official AU meeting. Yeah? But on that meeting, the heads of state present and governments present agreed to uh, urgently uh, deploy 
a high level delegation to the Congo to interact with all Congolese stakeholders with the view of reaching a consensus on the way out uh, of the political, uh, the post electoral crisis. They called upon the Congolese government to postpone the further process due to postpone the inauguration. But uh, Congolese authorities refused that scenario. The Constitutional Court endorsed the results of the Electoral Commission on the on 19th of January, and the African Union's mission was, uh, was cancelled. So on um, January 24th, Chisikedi was inaugurated as the DRC president. The neighboring countries and the wider region um, faced a sharp dilemma. On the one hand, there was a new political construction coming from a grossly manipulated electoral process with no guarantees for sustainable stability in Congo in the medium term, in the long run. But um, it was clear that this was probably the only way to avoid immediate violence. Eh? Uh, Kabila's camp was extremely uh, aware of the fact that if they should impose Shadari, that the popular resistance to that would be very high, with uh, probably uh, violent, uh, violent riots and probably uh, very chaotic situations. On the other hand, the um, the it was totally unlikely that the that Kabila's camp would ever accept uh, power to to be handed over to Martin Fayulu and the people behind them, especially um, Bemba Bemba and Katumbi. So um, after a short hesitation, the African multilater multilateral institutions opted for the short short term uh, stability, and almost immediately after that. Western diplomacies did the same. Everybody endorsed Tisigedi's presidency. What happened in public opinion was comparable to this. Hmm? The, the Congolese people likewise accepted the official results with a lot of pragmatism. That Kabila did not manage to secure a third time and was unable to crown uh, Ramazani Shadari as his successor that he was succeeded by an opposition member uh, without uh, major violence and chaos was already much more than most people had dared to hope for. So um, people were happy with the outcome, including a lot of the 60% of the voters who had voted for Fayulu. This was something that if you had known it before, we could have signed for it. Eh? Um, but of course, most of the people were aware of the fact that it was not the outcome of a transparent democratic process. They gave him the advantage of the doubt. They gave President Chisikedi the advantage of the doubt. So what does that mean? Is, it, is there a presidency on a leash? What's, what's the, 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 the space Chisikedi have, has uh, for his own, on his own? He, he started his presidency with a few signs that he generally wanted to improve the human rights situation and take up the struggle against the overwhelming corruption that Mobutu had institutionalized from the 70s onwards and that Kabila regime had continued to practice. Eh? Not much had been changed uh, throughout the decades in terms of the way the country was governed. Chisiki has very little space, but the little space he has, he uses and defends it with a lot of intelligence and a lot of strategic skills. People who have met him before, eh, including myself, did not expect this intelligence and uh, political intuition and uh, strategic capacity. So he's growing fast in his role from the beginning and was apparently accompanied by very talented uh, counselors. Eh? Uh, maybe for, to a huge extent, um, his ally, uh, Vital Kamere, uh, contributed to that. But we saw Felix Chisikedi growing much faster than we had thought possible. The new president faced the militant public opinion, including in his own party ranks, hmm? 
where people expect him to make a difference in the key areas which touch upon their lives. The potential violence since 2015 had been fueled by the fact that for a lot of people, the quality of their life had hardly improved in the last two decades. It was still very difficult to find a job, to find decent housing. People still had a very uh, problematic access to water and electricity. Um, unless you were rich, you didn't have, you don't, you still don't have access to health services or your kids are not able to go to, to good schools. Um, the human rights situation remained very problematic and the state, the state still did not have the instruments to impose and, and uh, organize the, the, the rule of law. Local conflicts um, um, are still violent and uncontrollable. It's still difficult to disarm the armed groups. People had seen that for the last decades and they had the impression that it had not changed. And people are, um, the president knew that people have are very aware of the fact that the Congolese authorities haven't been able to change the way of the, the way the country is governed. People know it's a governance problem. So um, Felix Gisikiri in the first weeks and months of his mandate has promised a lot of things in these key areas. I will bring, bring back peace in the East uh, your living conditions will improve very soon. Education will be free. And uh, he knows that if he will not be able to show results on these very concrete um, promises, he will have to, he will face the date of expiry of, of the goodwill he has, of at least the advantage of, of doubt. Um, in case he doesn't, he risks an increasing noisy and even violent opposition in the streets uh, in case people will not feel the convincing improvements. And he will, of course, have great difficulties to be re-elected. After the national elections, the direct elections, there were a number of indirect elections, right? including the Senate. And what we saw there, there was the uh, F the, that the FCC did not has did not have the slightest ambition to uh, work out a, a real power, power sharing coalition with Cash. Eh? Um, the former um, the former regime, let's let's say, um, deployed all its force to have an, a maximum of posts and functions and titles and, and means showed, um, proved itself to be extremely um, greedy. And, and we started to feel um, in, these, um, in these indirect elections and the, the, the whole um, series of nominations which followed that, that there was an, an, uh, a problem of tension within the camps. Hmm? It was not easy uh, for FCC to divide what they obtained, even if they obtained a lot, to divide that within its own camp and keep everybody satisfied. And that was the same at, at, uh, with Chisikedi. The um, expectations of his own political supporters eh, were, were higher than his capacity to, to satisfy that. An important moment was the nomination of uh, the, the prime minister. Um, it was an interesting event because it took a lot of time. Since Kabila and, and Kabila's party had the uh, majority in parliament, they had the right of initiative and eh? they had the right to propose to GCK, the uh, uh, candidates uh, for the uh, for the office of prime minister, and um, they did that five times. Uh, the five times GCK refused. All these people he, he he proposed. The most famous, the most visible, 
uh, are Albert Juma and Henri Mauve. Huh? The interesting thing was they all came from uh, Katanga and they were real stakeholders uh, in Kabila's uh, in, in, in uh, Kabila's inner circle, the real decision makers. And Chisikidi refused them one by one. Eventually, Silvestri Lunga uh, Ilukamba was appointed, much to everybody's surprise. A lot of people, including me, had never heard about him. Um, he's someone from Katanga as well, that belongs to the political family of uh, Joseph Kabila, but it's, he's not at all. Um, part of the, the strategic inner circle of Kabila, not Kabila's and not the uh, community's strategic inner circle. He served for a few years as a minister under Mobutu, has a rather technocrat, uh, technocratic um, image, background. He used to be for the last years, the, the national director of the, of the railways um, the impression most of us had was it's uh, something we had seen in the, in, in the past where you have um, a, a, a weak government uh, built up around a weak prime minister, which allowed the parallel structures, uh, parallel circuits which had existed under Mobutu and had continued under Kabila to continue to govern the country and um, take profit from the natural resources. Three months after uh, Ilunga's uh, nomination, a full government was, was uh, installed, again, with a majority of uh, FCC ministers. Um, the division of the mandates and responsibilities between the two camps uh, had been a very long and painful process. And uh, when you when, when we looked a bit more into that, it was the strange conclusion was that it, the, the thing that did take the most time was not the division between FCC and cash, but it had to do with the internal struggle within the camps. Um, so uh, even if Kabila maintained uh, his level of power, he inevitably had less posts and functions to divide among his key allies. And UDPS members were frustrated that they had to share what they considered as their, far, their fair part of, of, the, uh, of the cake, let's say it uh, unrespectfully, um, had to be shared with, with, with Camera, for instance. The army remains until today, uh, Kabila Fortress, Chisikedi tries to reinforce the older generation of officers who served under Mobutu, rather than officers who are a product of the wars in the East and the various waves of rebel integrations. These people have less formal military training and generally are considered as loyal to Kabila. Shortly after appointing Ilunga, uh, Chisikedi confirmed the mandates of both uh, Lieutenant General uh, Celestin Bala as the Army Chief of Staff, as well as Major General Jean-Claude Yav as the Private Military Chief of Staff to the President. These people were key people in the defense system that Kabila had built up around himself. Below that level, you have some newer people uh, who, who are not known as, as uh, Kabila uh, supporters. But, but what we see is uh, that Chisikedi, who has not a military background, who has not much understanding of the complex situation in the East, he tries very carefully to break, break in into the army and start to build himself some form of a network without doing that too brutally because he faces, he fears eh, that he might face um, um, coup scenarios. No? So it, until today, we can say that the army remains a bastion of a uh, fortress of, of Kabila. And then the interesting thing after a while, after the very polarized 
um, months in the beginning, we started to have the impression that Chisikedi and Kabila could live with the fact that they depend on each other to some extent eh? in an odd give and take relationship. Kabila things were not as they used to be, but he was still very powerful and he was obliged to take into account the signals and desires of Chisikedi. And that, that, uh, that was the result of a, a very complex process. And then after a while, we could see that these people could, could live with that, that, that Kabila and Chisikedi uh, um, approached uh, each other with respect. And that creates at this moment, uh, the impression of a certain stability. But we have to be aware of the fact, and it's very important, that the Congolese political landscape, as it uh, evolved towards the election of uh, December 2018, is a non-consolidated landscape with very weak institutional ties between and within the platforms, the coalitions, and the alliances. This means that individuals, communities, and regions which feel un- or underrepresented in this new government might seek new alliances or manipulate local conflicts and armed groups to improve their position on the political chessboard. In the meantime, uh, the security and human rights situation in the east of the country is not improving, and people still wait for a major sign that the government takes genuine steps towards better governance and less corruption. There has been the very visible and um, uh, case of against Vital Kamere. Kamere had been uh, arrested and, con and condemned on uh, corruption charges and he's now facing his process in appeal. He served as uh, Chisikedi's chief of staff and main political ally. Um, and so this arrest puts uh, a lot of pressure on the cash alliance, especially because uh, for some people within Camara's camp, it, uh, they consider it as something which has been orchestrated uh, by the Chisikedi people in order to uh, neutralize Camara uh, for the next elections. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Chisikedi has traveled a lot. He has invested in Africa's multilateral institutions. The, the, the latest ambition is that he wants to lead the African Union from February 2021 onwards. And he has discreetly set up a working committee in preparation of, for his future term as chairperson. He uh, also tries to set up a coordination system between Congo and its eastern neighbors in order to take full control over the armed groups and restore security in Kivu. But that's very sensitive. Huh? It always was and it continues to be because of the roles the neighbor countries, neighboring countries uh, have played in uh, the civil wars. And we have to be aware, of course, if we talk about an alliance between DRC, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda and Tanzania, we would we are talking about um, a coalition eh? and and uh, uh, brigades and just really military cooperation between partners who have among themselves a very difficult relationship, a very difficult relationship. The relations between Rwanda and Burundi, between Uganda and Rwanda, are extremely complex, and all of these. Uh, countries have uh, have uh, an armed opposition uh, against their regime on co uh, Congolese soil. So it's very problematic to, to put this together. And Chisigidi knows that he will not be able to, to solve that problem on his own. What does that mean eh? uh, in terms of new uh, elections? The new political constellation is the result of manipulated election, uh, uh, elections, and it's very fragile. Chisikedi is in a very uncomfortable position between, on the one hand, Kabila's FCC with an overwhelming majority in parliament in the provinces, and on the other hand, international partners who encourage the new president to take as much space from Kabila as possible. 
uh, and but who are very aware of it, very aware that this presidency is the result of an undemocratic election. Um, it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting dilemma. Huh? People know where his presidency comes from, but they also know that the only way uh, to uh, transform this fake handover of power into some form of reality is by reinforcing Kisigedi's presidency. His relation with the electorate is very complex. A considerable part of the public opinion seems to give Kisigedi's presidency the advantage of doubt. Uh, And, and he will face uh, potential violence if he does not fulfill that. And there have been riots already, uh, not in the, not very recently, but in in the uh, in 2019. And that's that's an indication of how explosive situation could become. Um, The choice of the African multilateral institutions and later the, the Western partners to endorse GCKD's much contested victory uh, has been very important. And that's a choice for short term um, security. Huh? Um, it seemed the best and only way to avoid chaos. So um, there is absolutely not much uh, sustainable in. Uh, some people continue to say, uh, okay, this is democracy. It's not full democracy, but it's a small step and, and it, it, at least it's, it's a progress. Personally, I, uh, I doubt that. Um, so the image on the podium during Chisikedi's oath-taking ceremony we started with was strong and meaningful. The outgoing president relaxed and smiling and comfortable with the situation. The sweating new president uh, apologizing for his moment of weakness because he nearly fainted. On that moment, many people, including myself, uh, regarded Chisikedi as a mouse in the paws of a cat who was absolutely sure to eat it at, on the moment that it wanted to eat it. Scenarios were circulating already about um, uh, an early end of Chisikedi's term, eh? logistic scenarios, but also impeachment, eh? because Chisikedi had um, submitted a fake diploma as part as part of his dossier as a candidate. Eh? He he cheated on that, and there are, there is evidence on that, but. Um, the situation he, he survived and he developed from there he defended his space the little space he had while Kabila continued to to control the economy the army and most of the political institutions in my in my view the only real uh, evidence of power that uh, Chisikedi has given in in those uh, 20 months is the fact that he refused five candidates, five strong candidates, five key persons with, uh, in Kabila's inner circle as prime minister. That is the that is the most important signal I've uh, I've seen. So um, we've seen two leaders who could live with that cohabitation, and um, who uh, focused on the discontent in their own camp. Um, I have the impression that Kabila has been able to consolidate his camp better and earlier than, than Chisikedi. And um, the last months, Kabila seems very confident in the future, convinced that he, or in case that's necessary, someone who, who he will indicate as a candidate for presidency in his camp, would win the 2020, 2023 election without too much of cheating or violence, without too much of intimidation. For his part, Chisikedi realizes that his promises have only been very partially fulfilled and that there is no chance that he will be able to fulfill them entirely before the end of the mandate. So, um, and you can see already now in the communication strategy of FCC, 
they deploy they deploy messages putting the entire burden of the lack of progress on Tsikedi's shoulders, which is odd because in fact they control most of the most of the instruments of the state. Hmm? So um, not long ago, Felix Tsikedi seems to be preparing seem to be preparing attacks on key institutions that Kabila controls and which allow them to win the 2018 uh, election. Huh? Institutions like the Constitutional Court, institutions like the Independent Electoral Commission. These, these institutions have been crucial to, uh, to work out the deal that we're talking about. And it's absolutely clear that Kabila will need them again in 2023. So if, if Chisikidi continues to, to pressurize on that, and it's a key moment now huh, around the Constitutional Court these days and today, then um, we, we can expect that the, the tension will, will, will uh, rise in the very short run. If Chisikidi would uh, extend the fight against corruption far beyond uh, Vital Kamere, and start to touch upon key people around Kabila or, or even Kabila's own uh, economic empire, we'll see that the political climate will, will, will deteriorate very, very rapidly. Chisikidi is not even halfway his mandate and the chances that he will materialize his promises and the people's expectations seem very bleak. Um, in January 2000, 18, once again, 2019, once again, the country seemed close to its uh, implosion, but with the most unlikely political deal that was avoided. But no sustainable progress will be made in the struggle against the root causes of Congo's conflict. The people in Congo's suburbs, plains, and on the hills will still have the profound impression that their lives haven't improved. It's hard to imagine how they can be mobilized for new elections and believe elections are a legitimate tool for constructive change, not after what happened in 2018-19. By endorsing the outcome of the 2018 election in the knowledge that it was fraudulently, fraudulently obtained, the African and international communities uh, have not only robbed the Congolese people of its choice, but also delivered a disastrous signal to other countries where dictators cling to power no matter the price. And for me, uh, I conclude with Congo remains and will continue to be a roller coaster of events and emotions where one should always expect the uh, unexpected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for this uh, uh, wide ranging and, as I said, uh, granular. Uh, report on uh, the elections um, in this country that uh, lurches from crisis to crisis and from contradiction to contradiction, uh, despite its uh, strategic position uh, on the continent and indeed um, uh, in the world. Um, we have, uh, we don't have uh, too much time left for a lot of questions, but there is one that has been uh, posted by an anonymous, an anonymous uh, attendee. And I'll read it to you, Chris, so you can uh, answer it. Have you found that President Chisekedi has been more open to working with international organizations and civil society like Lucha and Filimbi to support peacekeeping missions like that of MONUSCO? And if so, do you think this has allowed MONUSCO to establish a bigger presence in combating the security issues in the East and supporting human rights defenders. Um, yes, I think it's very important that GCKD uh, can to, to, to realize that GCKD considers the international context as an ally and eh? they endorsed him and they uh, want to reinforce his presidency. So that, that's, that's important, that's extremely uh, crucial uh, because he knows that he does not manage the factors uh, from, from, uh, from the field and from the Congolese institutions. 
that 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 he has been clearly doing that uh, from the very beginning. Maybe in the beginning a bit more than than now. He divided his time between international partners and um, including including the USA uh, and uh, the, the 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 region. He has tried to consolidate his position there before he could even dare to uh, dream to confront confront Kabila. Uh, what that means for MONUSCO, for me, it's not it's not very clear. Of course, uh, the 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 clash that we have seen in the last years of the Kabila regime against Mugu, uh, against MONUSCO was 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 extremely hard. It was very very focused. There was a strategy to diminish and even make uh, MONUSCO disappear. Um, I, I, and, and of course, the, 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 the attitude of Chisikidi towards that is, is much more uh, benevolent. It's much more, uh, it's much more positive. What that means for uh, the future and the future size of MONUSCO remains, remains to be seen, of course. Uh, for the last years, MONUSCO has, has uh, a lot of difficulties to, to to work together with, with, with Congolese authorities and, 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 and the army, for instance, in the joint operations, which uh, have happened and which stopped happening at a certain moment. I'm not sure if that is really, uh, if that is really improving. And um, in terms of human rights situations and, and uh, the attitude to, to, to La Lucha, for instance, if you talk to La Lucha, um, they are not impressed by uh, the improvements that uh, they could enjoy. Eh? Mm -hmm. They don't see themselves um, getting arrested at, at, and beaten at any any occasion. So there has been a lot of window dressing. Uh, is there a fundamentally different approach, the fundamental improvement? I am not sure at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, answer. Is there another question? Perhaps it will be the last one. Okay, here's a, here's a question, uh, an interesting one that is debated often in Congo. Uh, sorry to take you away from the main topic. A lot has been said about Kabila Jr. Is he Laurent's real son? Did he orchestrate his stepfather's uh, step in parenthesis, father's assassination? Um, well, we all, we all heard these speculations about his origins. Um, I talked to a lot of people, um, international researchers and people within uh, the circles of Kabila. Um, honestly, I don't have any reason to doubt that Kabila's, um, that Joseph Kabila is the biological son of Laurent Désiré. Huh? And um, most of the independent people do not really doubt that. Um, has he been involved in the uh, death of his father? I did not exclude that for a while. Hmm? I think that uh, Father Kabila eh, has not been assassinated by his enemies, but by his friends. Hmm? Uh, I think that he was supported by regimes, eh, Angola, Zimbabwe, who uh, found that the man was no longer um, useful because he, um, almost on his own, he blocked the, 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 the agreements of Lusaka and and, and Angola Zimbabwe lost troops in those wars, had a public, had a, had a, had a problem with their own public opinion and all. And at, uh, on, uh, at a certain moment, after the, um, the loss of the Battle of Pueto, which was on the Congolese side, led by a totally unknown general at that moment called Joseph Kabila. Hmm? Um, Zimbabwe lost elite troops, and, and then uh, I think that was the, the loss too much. And six weeks later, he died. Uh, and I did not exclude for a while that Joseph Kabila at least was informed about that. 
but but going deeper into the people around him and, and talking to them, I I I I'm it's not something I could confirm now. I, I don't think that he was involved. I don't think he was aware. He was um, a young general who has been picked up by the environment of his father in order to win the time to, uh, to solve their unsolved issues among themselves. And then uh, he um, had support from, 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 from people to uh, very quickly, um, let's say, neutralize the, the hardcore people of his father's environment and put the peace uh, agreements back on, back on tracks. Uh, because very soon we started to talk about the, uh, the, the uh, inter-Congolese dialogue and very soon we really started to discuss the withdrawal of the foreign troops, things which hadn't been possible with, with, with Laurent Capilla. But um, I see an agenda in this, but I don't think that uh, Joseph Kabila uh, was really in, in, um, involved. I think he was probably um, instru instrumentalized, if the word exists in English. Huh? But, um, and then he started to grow in his own role later. Huh? He started to develop an ego. He himself had people around him like Sando Caputo, like Camere. Uh, who, who, who made him grow. And then, and then his ego started to boost after 2006 when he, when he felt um, his legitimacy was, was really uh, a fact. Um, so, um, and then the man has been in power for, for 18, 19 years. So no one can do a job for 18, 19 years if he's not good in it and if he does not is if he's not growing in it. But but the young Kabila, as we have no, seen him for the first time, standing next to the coffin of his father, I don't think that he was part of the master plan to uh, to kill his father. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we still have about uh, f uh, f 15 or so people uh, around. So and many who had to leave have left. And okay. uh, But we can continue for a little bit. And I would like to continue uh, to pursue uh, this question of whether uh, Joseph Kabila is uh, the, the real child of uh, Laurent Désiré or not. Behind, behind it is a question of citizenship, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, our graduate students who won the, uh, the prize will talk about in January. Um, citizenship is at the root of many issues, it seems to me, uh, that bring about uh, civil conflict, especially in the East, uh, the borderlands of, uh, you know, uh, especially between Rwanda and Congo. If we think about, um, uh, you know, Ruchuru, and, uh, but also Minembwe uh, more, more recently, uh, all that has, uh, has its root in the issue of citizenship. Uh, in fact, um, when you, you know, in Kinshasa, people think that everybody from the East must be uh, from Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And so they should not be there, whether they are Rwandans or not. So can you speak to uh, the, the importance of citizenship in uh, Congolese conflict, including elections and human rights issues? Yeah, um, it's um, extremely sensitive and it's also extremely, um, it's also extremely complex. Huh? Yes. If we talk about the Rwandese uh, speaking community in Congo, this is a very diverse group. Huh? When we talk uh, about Minembe, for instance, the Banya Mulenge, you have a situation where um, these are people who are in Congo for uh, a long time. These are people who have been involved in the rebellions of uh, 1998, 2002. But these people have refused to step in the new rebellions. Eh? Luang Kundas, um, CNDP, and M23 afterwards, they, did, they could not count on the Banyamulenge support, the massive Banyamulenge support. Of course, they're, all, they're always individuals. Eh? So 
the situation uh, around Minembue is very different as the situation in uh, in Ruchuru and Masisi, huh? where you have uh, a Randese community which um, has its own uh, Hutu Tutsi uh, divisions, for instance, uh, which went much f further in supporting the uh, Randese agenda in Congo. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be aware that that the question of supporting the Randi speaking communities in Congo has been an extremely complex issue in Rwanda itself. If you look at the divisions within the regime, they do they do their best to hide them. Huh? Mm -hmm. But, but um, you see that a lot of um, competition in the regime is caused by by different views on how to deal with the Randi's community. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about M23 crisis and the, the fall of Goma in uh, November 2012, uh, this was a very important uh, friction between, between, uh, between uh, M23 and Rwanda and within Rwanda. So um, the problems of cohabitation in, in the East and not only in the East, are extremely are extremely important. I do believe that um, um, it's uh, it's very important to 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 restore the, the 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 rule of law. I do believe that local issues uh, can only be solved if if democracy will be working from its grassroots level as it's supposed to be eh, in the constitution. But uh, we had elections, we had electoral cycles in 2006, 2011, and December 2018. But on none of these occasions, the uh, local elections have been have been organized, and that is that is uh, that's a dramatic situation because the architecture of the Congolese state is is a heavy roof. Eh? It's it, there's a presidency, there's a parliament, and and weak, uh, weak walls and the provincial assemblies are problematic in many reasons and there is no foundation because everything below that has never been has never been organized. Um, I think that, 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 that the, the, the problems of cohabitation will also depend on the capacity to, to, to bring communities uh, together at a very local level. All right. There is a, just a comment, and we can comment on the comment for just a few minutes. I think we'll stop in about five minutes. Um, quote, it's crazy to hear that Mobutu's specter is still looming within the government so many years later. And then uh, uh, this person says, uh, thanks for the great talk, uh, Mr. Berwoods. So, um, you know, and what I would say about that is that what I've noticed uh, especially in Africa, but in other places as well, is that the political culture of a country is very difficult to change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, <laughs> in this country, maybe we're, we're at the doorstep of, of changing the political culture, uh, but, um, but uh, it's certainly the case in Congo that it's going to be a long time until um, Mobutu's Spectre disappears, and at, at this juncture, there is no nothing to indicate that uh, things are improving. Yeah, for me, there are two dimensions to what to what you are saying. On the on the the first one is, as you call it, political culture. We should not forget that um, we had to we had to invent the term kleptocracy in the 70s to, descri to describe the practices within Mobutu's regime. Uh, and he went um, so far in that that you had to invent another word, which is um, self-cannibalization, -cannibali luto cannibalization de, de l'État. Uh, the state eats itself. The people in the state dismantle the state by just eating the assets, uh, stealing the, 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 the assets. Mobutu uh, had the formal instruments of, of uh, state and uh, elections and parliament, etc. 
and he um, managed, he ruled the country through parallel circuits mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, uh, clientelism and based on uh, very deep um, corruption eh? and bad, bad, bad governance. So, and probably on the moment that you take over as a new regime, okay, eh? first father and then son Kapila, um, that would have been the thing to change, hmm? to try to restore the instruments of the state in their full in their full uh, legacy and 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 to 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 reinforce them and that has not happened um kabila did not manage and some people including myself uh, think that he did not try or not a lot because it turned out to be a very lucrative way of doing that uh, of ruling a country and in the same way that um, Mobutu has built up an economic empire of his own, Kabila has done exactly Something. the same. Yeah. Um, he did not change it fundamentally, and he adapted it to a new, to a new world, to a new world order, to new power relationships. And he did that very skillfully, I think. Huh? Uh, he managed to do that. He still manages to do that. That's one di dimension. The other dimension, uh, if you look at different political families, uh, if you look at the army, eh, you will find a lot of Mobutu's political personnel still in charge. And, and that, that, that I found that Congo is a country of survivors. Eh? Mm -hmm. You're on. They chase you away, you remain silent for a while and you prepare your comeback. Institutionally, everything is very weak, so you have to see what, what the platforms and alliances and there's a lot of them. And then you have to try to connect to upcoming forces and, and, and come back on their back. And they, they, they carry you to... And, and, it was remarkable how very soon after the after ninety seven, yeah, uh, people started to to come back. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the background, the CVs of a lot of people in charge now, then you see okay, these people have their roots under the Mobutu regime, mm -hmm. and this for me is is. Uh, a very interesting illustration of, of, of the survival of the fittest and political culture of, of Congo. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, uh, Kabila is uh, plotting his uh, return very studiously right now. Yes, uh, yeah. except the fact that he has never been away. But yeah, yeah. yeah and I mean, yes. he, his cards, he has yeah. good cards in his hand for the moment, yeah. honestly. Yeah. In fact, there was a, a meeting just uh, yesterday, or was it? Yes. A meeting just uh, yesterday uh, to uh, to do more to prepare for for the return. Two years, uh, three years before the election. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Unless uh, there are more questions from uh, the different participants, uh, we will call it a day. And uh, very much thank Chris for this very uh, interesting talk. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for, for coming and for participating in this event. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It was an honor and a joy. See you next yes, time. You. All right. Bye-bye.